and it's going to be a bit cosy because of the room, but we're doing an exercise called Boating with Your Feet. And what I've got here is three different statements that I'm going to read out. And in a while, I'd like everyone to come down to the front. And as Rosemary said, there's some bits here that you can pick up if you want to wear some beautiful badges. Welcome. Do take one. I've got one saying, I'm here for the gender analysis. Gender and ethics is everyone's business. So when I read out the statement, if you really strongly agree with it, I want you to go right up here. This wall is strongly, strongly agree. <laughs> and this wall, this side, is strongly, strongly disagree. And then along the pathway is, I'm in the middle, and then I pretty much disagree. And I pretty much <laughs> agree here, right? So does that make sense? So please all come down to the front, stand in different places, I'll read the statement. So remember, strongly disagree, strongly agree. Gender roles and relations are so context specific, you cannot generalise learning across countries. I'll read it one more time. Gender roles and relations are so context specific, you cannot generalise learning across countries. Can you remind us again for the really jet lagged? <laughs> strongly agree, strongly disagree. So you cannot generalise. So it's a negative question. If you think you cannot generalise, <laughs> so if you agree that you cannot generalize, you can <laughs> within the realities of, North, of Uganda. So you're saying we can't generalise beyond that. Let's have someone else that's up this end. Anything to add to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit, um, 
specific too. So I think there's a lot of ideas of what we have for gender that's context specific, but I think even within those contexts, women perform or men perform or other genders perform their role differently. And sometimes you can't generalize because you're making the wrong generalization. So I think you have to be really careful about saying all of society, this is what this role is going to do because there's people who are outside of that as well, even within their own role. Okay, so as individuals, mm -hmm. we have our own positionality, views, perspectives that are shaped by the norms around us, mm -hmm. but we may react to those differently, Correct. depending on how we are positioned. Mm -hmm. And you have some concerns around some of the assumptions that we might make to generalize broader statements. Right, we're moving up. Let's have someone. So, as the other end, I agree with everything that I've heard over here, and I think that I'm here um, more out of personal political commitments because I think that um, promoting equity, and this is gender equity, class equity, what other kind of equity we're talking about, necessitates systematic analysis. And so, while I wholeheartedly agree that gender is one of these, well, I don't want to say one of these categories, but it's a category that is constantly abused because we take things like we look at gender roles and we say, oh, I learned about one gender role and therefore I'm going to extrapolate to the entire world. I think that's seriously flawed and I think that, that um, what you just said about individuals is super important for us to also keep into mind that even if you put your finger on the pulse of gender in one family, one place, it doesn't tell you much. But I don't see how we can battle equity without trying to distill forces like power relations down to basic roots, and so I think it's an imperative if we want to move forward to a more equitable <coughs> society that we learn how to figure out what can we extrapolate about power relations that we share and what do we need to leave behind. So it's a really important line to draw on the sand, and I think that we can do it wrong by saying, ooh, we're tackling gender um, and doing it in a sloppy way and actually not making any forward movement on equity, but I don't see how to get to equity without any sort of a systematic analysis. Mm -hmm. So that's why I put myself mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, I'm moving up. So Laura Trotu, oh, we've got others even further. Are you part of the exercise for you? concern is that the, ex the argument of, oh, well, it's different here, is one that's used to avoid change. Mm -hmm. um, and there are common features around powerlessness, which I think um, is presumably why you're working on this issue. There may be people who aren't powerless, wives of presidents or whatever, um, or they may still have aspects of their lives that are governed by their gender, but um, there are aspects of the position of women in society that seem to me to be fairly um, universal, so that I think the difference argument can be used as an excuse for not doing anything in a whole range of areas, not just gender. So that's why I'm plunking myself in. Thank you. 
Um, Shrey Tush, you're right here, right? No, it's the same. Okay, Shrey Tush, Laura, okay, let's have another perspective from that end of the spectrum. Who's? Sure. I think that it's really like structural violence and sort of oppression is really difficult to see. It's not mm -hmm. going to jump out at you when you're embedded within a culture mm -hmm. or when you're new to it. They still often really hard to see. And I think that you have to take learnings from other mm -hmm. contexts mm -hmm. so that you can identify them and see how they're working. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just going to get inculcated into the norms of that society and it's going to appear to you as if it's not mm -hmm. violent and oppressive. Mm -hmm. Interesting, thank you. Anything else? Laura, Shredditch? Yeah, I think it's just more about how, I do think it's not possible to generalise, it's more about how you generalise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can generalise within contexts as well as between mm -hmm. different contexts. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think. So thank you. Okay. Yeah, actually, in my experience, I work with literate women groups. Like my master's research was um, focusing on how literate women groups can be used to spread um, uh, health awareness. Uh, so uh, this was all, this was a community-based health promotion intervention. So I saw it in two areas of Haryana, two blocks. So there was one block. Haryana is a really patriarchal society in India. So. Uh, the mobility of women is really compromised, they cannot move out and this intervention um, mandated women to um, form groups and you know come out of their homes and talk about health. So I saw the intervention in two areas which were not so far away and one area was um, uh, you know it was really patriarchal and there was another area where uh, women still had some freedom. So the effects of the intervention in both the areas were, were really different. And you know, I just couldn't recommend that whether these uh, women groups are successful here or not. Mm -hmm. So within one area, within two blocks, there's so much difference. So that's why I thought it's really different. Context is really important when we're talking about interventions. Mm -hmm. So maybe there are concepts like um, glass ceiling, which are universal, but there are some things which maybe they're not. Mm -hmm. So we, like everybody said, we need to be careful about how we're generalizing. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so I just want to make one reflection back to everyone. I'm really pleased that you spread out so well for space <laughs> issues, <laughs> apart from anything else. And it's a really interesting question, isn't it? It's a challenging question, and I love the responses and the range and the ways that have been thought through and expressed. I mean, for me, obviously, context matter. And as you said, even within these two blocks, within that Indian context, the ways in which gender and class interplay shaped what people did and their experiences. And when we're doing research, I think what's really important is to bring out context in our reports and make it as richly and thickly described as possible. So from a qualitative social science perspective, we talk about thick description. So that if I'm reading a paper and I'm sitting in another context, I have a real sense of that context. So the more we can describe it, the more we can support generalizability that the assumptions are unpacked, if you like. And I think that we have to look at ways to support some generalizability of conceptual issues, of bringing out power, gender, equity, and how that plays out in different ways. And when you're writing a research paper, to me, that's what comes out in the discussion. <laughs> it's not a double negative. You're <laughs> okay. yeah. Right. It is unfair and inappropriate to expect health service providers to mitigate power dynamics between couples seeking services. Right. I'm just going to again. <laughs> it is unfair and inappropriate to expect service providers to mitigate power dynamics between couples seeking services. <laughs> it's unfair and service providers should not have to get involved or be part of couple dynamics, you go there. If you think they should, 
colleagues and the context of Afghanistan, where I've spent a lot of time and a lot of work. Um, and the fact that that expectation could result in death mm -hmm. places me here. So I would never presume to expect that that would be a role that someone must take up. Mm -hmm. if, if healthcare workers ask and requested of, of their colleagues to learn how to mitigate or in, intervene in some way or advocate, and they were able to take that risk, then of course you'd want those resources there to support them in their decision to, to intervene or advocate. But um, I would feel it, it's, it's such a delicate, high-risk situation that I would never presume to expect. Thank you, that's a very powerful statement. So it's very challenging and it's a very difficult job to do and in some contexts the risks associated with it are huge. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to take it incredibly carefully and not expect that of all health workers. There's lots of nodding in your little group around you, yeah. but would anyone else around Jennifer like to add? Kelly. Um, so I study because basically I 100% agree with what she was saying, but then at the same point I think my personal view is that everyone in society, regardless of the fact that it's you know health professional or whoever you are, I just feel everyone in society has a role to play mm -hmm. in in basically the question that you asked, you know, like just uh, breaking down or, or trying to make make changes in terms of whether it's gender equity or issues around power relations. Mm -hmm. I feel that everybody in society can play some some role, mm -hmm. but then, as she very nicely described, it's complicated sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So it's interesting as well, like, healthcare providers, yes, in a way that all of us have a responsibility. Is it fair to particularly pull out health workers with the high risks associated? <laughs> yeah, we can try. I can try. Yeah. Yeah. No, we can try. Okay. So please come. Okay. 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 Et que le, le mari n'accepte pas que la femme puisse faire la planification familiale. Dans ce cas, le prestataire de service peut intervenir pour au moins sensibiliser la, le, le mari pour qu'il puisse laisser à sa femme le temps de reposer pour qu'il qu ait une, une bonne santé ensuite pour la santé de ses enfants. Dans ce cas, je peux dire que le prestataire de service peut intervenir en tant que médiateur. Okay. 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 So in Senegal, it depends. It's also context specific. And for she was giving an example. For example, if a health worker has in front of him a woman who has um, lots of pregnancy without any spaces, then the, the the health worker can have the role 
to talk with the husband and ask him to make him awareness about family planning and urge him to take the to let his wife, for example, takes a birth control just for the well-being of the mother. So he can be he, uh, the health worker can have like a mediating role. mediator role in that case. So thank you. So it depends on the health issue. So we're saying with multiple pregnancies within the Senegalese context, that could be a role there. Okay. We've got two people standing next to each other here. Let's hear from both of you. Okay. I think it's a little bit related to what she was saying that it depends on the health issue as well. Because I think in that case, the provider is able to be a mediator just because of the power dynamics. In some way, we respect doctors mm -hmm. and what they're telling us. So maybe there is some possibility of um, the intervention working. But at the same time, if you look at something like domestic violence, right? If you look at mm -hmm. a physician, it could be a nurse, and maybe she's also suffering from domestic violence. So sometimes in that way, it's a little bit unfair to even expect them. Or maybe to them, it's not even something that they would think is an issue because it's a norm. Uh, for them in their own individual life as well. So in as much as we could look at uh, health providers, they are also part of the society embedded in those structural violences and asking them to participate in um, mitigating gender inequity may be a little bit difficult. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you. So it's a similar point to Adriana Sam, but saying as healthcare workers, we are also part and parcel of the gender norms that play out, which and we might be experiencing gender violence ourselves. Um, I, I think to me it depends on who's asking for the intervention into the relationship. And in a lot of domestic violence counseling that I've seen, uh, there's this expectation that the husband must be involved or the abuser must be involved in the process, but does the woman want that intervention? And it's the same with family planning, that some women will say, can you talk to my husband? He may, you know, he may be more receptive to listening to you, whereas some women may say, I'm just going to do the procedure stealth stealthily. I don't want anybody to know about it. So I think it depends on who's making the decision of getting the health worker involved in the relationship. Yeah, great point. <laughs> Joe? So I just think, as a healthcare worker, it's very so my previous life was as well. So um, I think, you know, I've had that experience. And I think you need support, training, and help to do that, because it's very, very challenging, particularly in the settings that people have brought up before. Um, I think it's really important. I think it's, it's a very interesting issue, but I just want to reflect upon the fact that what is, it, what, what, what is the, the, the focus that we're looking at? We're looking at the health system perspective or we're looking at the individual level? Because if we, if we leave decisions, all decisions regarding health, mm -hmm. the individual level, for the provider to decide whether they are, or they want or not to meet it with the gender inequity, then I think that is something that is uh, scary. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we should provide, um, on the other hand, I think we should foster, but across the health system, which is foster that people can first mm -hmm. identify the gender inequities and do something about it. Because if you can do something, it's not that you have to solve the problem, but you can do a lot of stuff. For example, mm -hmm. uh, you can you can provide information when we talk about the environment violence exposure, right? You may not be able to solve the problem to remove the problem from that uh, from that environment. However, you can you can guide her to resources in the community where she can get some help. Mm -hmm. And you always can do something. Mm -hmm. But I think that it has to be, it has to be, have to do a, a lot of governance and how, I mean, and, and we're monitoring the system so that, that we know that these actions are actually being implemented and done regardless of leaving the actions to the will of the individuals themselves. Yeah. And of course, you need to have a supportive environment. Yes. And that comes from the mm -hmm. okay. But yeah, I think you should be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Not maybe solve the problem, but provide some support for that. Uh, but first, to be able to identify that there is a problem. Thank you. That is a very interesting reflection on the health system's responsibility, the governance, the accountability, and the support that health workers would need. Sarah, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add to what you're saying. You want to see the health system is not just about the provision of health services. It's really part and parcel of everything going on in society. And in many places, healthcare workers are the only people people can go to for advice. Mm -hmm. So gender inequalities occur in society like very many other things that are not going right. 
So just like someone may approach a healthcare worker for something on torture and violence mm -hmm. and political whatever, they can also approach the health worker on matters to do with gender. Mm -hmm. And I think at that point, the health workers have to be ready mm -hmm. to know that they don't stop yeah. at the point of giving healthcare. Yeah. Sometimes it might require them. So, so just add, oh, <laughs> just add quite, quite, yeah. just add yeah. point. I think it's about ethics of yeah. medical practice. Yeah. So it's about the ethics of doing um providing services to buy to an ethical <coughs> process, so kind of placing the expectation on the healthcare provider or even on, on us as researchers to do research or um, provide services in a way that sort of maybe not mitigate but does not also create all these gender inequities of power relations in the world. Thank you. Sure. Um, I do agree that there is a role of a uh, health worker in in uh, <coughs> intervention the decision between the uh, couple. Because first, I think the value of health worker uh, is from uh, the value that health worker has in the community is stronger than normal people. Suppose you are the normal people and you say that oh, you should practice family planning because you have a very frequent birth uh, uh, birth delivery, something like that. But if you are not a health worker, I don't think people will listen to you much. But if you are a health worker, perhaps it's more effective to tell the woman and tell the husband. This is first point. Second point, I also agree with uh, everyone, uh, previous uh, participant there. It's about how do we think that the uh, uh, health worker has enough capacity in doing their so. Mm -hmm. And it's also about the macro policy with uh, any like, interest of training the health worker, mentoring the health worker to play a role and intervene in this power dynamic system. Okay, last point. Yeah, I, I agree with, with that point, with pretty well everything that's been said. It's just I also think we need to be fair to the health workers. Sometimes it is just not possible for them to take on that role. They have massive workloads. It, it's just, so I don't think we should put everything on them as well. There's only so much that they can do where, where it's possible. Absolutely, and I think training is critical. Because I think it's a very tricky thing to get into, but often I think we have unrealistic expectations of what they can do. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just going to make some summary comments again. I think uh, healthcare providers are people that we come in contact with throughout our lifetime. So they have the potential to be agents of change if appropriately supported. And the discussion to me here very nicely summarises the diagram Rosemary showed us earlier around gender analysis playing out at multiple levels. The individual, as a woman, a man, a transgender person seeking care, the experience of the health worker, and the health systems and governance processes. And if we are to expect health workers to mitigate in highly sensitive political gender relations and power relations, that could have extreme unintended consequences. The Afghanistan example brings that into sharp focus. We have to support them. And we have to support them through ongoing supervision. That also enables reflection on a personal perspective around how gender roles and relations shape us and how we interact, because we are also part of those. So there has been a lot of nice examples of health workers for change and other programs that enable that sort of reflection. So thank you. An interesting discussion, and I think one that is at the heart of gender equity and health systems and how it plays out at all those different levels.